with that said, let's do another pass on recurrent neural networks. And today we're going to look at a couple of more advanced concepts such that at least you've seen them and get a little bit of an idea of you know, what they're good for. More than, well, we'll look at some code, but this is more on the concept side. Okay. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at deep RNNs. So let's think a little bit about you know, where you could actually use RNNs, and this is shamelessly stolen from Andy Carpati's blog. Um, so what we did before we started working with sequence models is we basically had one-to-one -one problems. We have some input, you do something with that input, and you get some output. Right? Now, this is you know, a perfectly reasonable thing, and you know, classification and regression problems fall into this category quite nicely. Now, there's a related model, which is basically you have one input, and then you have multiple outputs. For instance, you know, if you ask Alexa, Alexa, tell me a story about cats. Right? That's one input, well, or at least you know, with some hand wavy argument. And then, you know, Alexa will start generating a story about cats. Unfortunately, they are probably pre-canned, and somebody, somebody's job is there to write out cat, to find cat jokes and cat stories. But you could conceivably assume that at some point in the future, you know, we would have some mechanism that generates that. Here's another one. Um, you know, you want to drive, let's say, from here to Sunnyvale. So then the input is destination Sunnyvale, and the network starts generating the path to get me from here to Sunnyvale. Right. So that's one to many. Um, there are other things where it's many to one. Imagine you, in the end, you know, may, I don't know, probably there's some review, and you know, somebody will ask, you know, how was the lecture? And maybe then the summary is something like, yeah, Alex was a nice guy, but you know, he never shaves and uh, he always looks messy and uh, I can't understand what he's talking about. Uh, he's horrible. So then in the end, well, you want to translate that into a score. And so that's many to one, right? So you have to review text and you might want to convert that into a score, like Yelp reviews or lecture reviews or whatever. And that's you know many to one. Then there's of course many to many, and that's the case. For instance, in machine translation, let's say I start with a sentence in English, and then I want to translate it into German. Then I would first you know go and you know parse the entire English se sentence, and then I do something with that, and I start emitting one German word after the other. Right. That's many to many. Uh, sometimes people refer that to that as sequence to sequence. And there are the cases where you don't have a one-to-one -one correspondence, and there are the cases where you do, right? And the cases where you do life is usually a lot easier. Um, one example for that would be named entity recognition, where you basically go over the entire sequence and then you tag every word as to what whether it belongs to named entity. Right. Um, RNNs, so recurrent neural networks, can be used for a lot of those things. There are other tools that you can use, like transformers, which kind of try to capture some of the better properties of RNNs and combine it with some of the better properties of convolutional models. And we'll get to that later. So Mu will probably cover that in the next few lectures. Um, so this is just generally the structure of it. So here's you know, some of the examples. Um, any questions so far about you know, use cases of sequence models? Yes? So this is um, the specific. So for the first case of the sequence to sequence, do we need to tell it from um, or the framework explicitly that they don't use the human output as the output? So for the first step, mm -hmm. Um, okay, so if I do sequence to sequence, well, what really, is ha what really happens, and so that picture is actually an oversimplification, 
is you first go and take your original sequence and you encode it in some meaningful way, right? So you basically pre-process it by doing feature maps and so on. You then take what you get from this and you start generating output text. And that comes with its own hidden representation. And that may actually live in a very different space. For instance, for the encoder, you might have 100 dimensions. And for the decoder, you have 50, right? Um, this is actually drawn in a slightly misleading way. Probably a slightly better way of drawing this would be, so I have my source sequence here. Fine, then we go and encode this. And then I actually get some you know, target sequence and I start generating these things, which then allow me to generate the actual output. So that would be probably a slightly more accurate way of representing it. What you later on see is that the attention mechanism will actually, and the, of course these lines, that of course will actually end up referring back maybe here, and this one will refer back to that, that we'll keep on looking at the source as we generate the target. Um, so this is the, this is probably one of the more ingenious ideas that have come out of deep learning modeling simply as a way of going non-parametric. The benefit of this is that if I have a very, very long sequence that keeps on going on and on and never ends and keeps on rambling forever and ever, then the machine translation for that would have to be a very, very long target sequence. So you probably don't remember anymore what I started saying in the beginning because I just went on talking forever. Nor does your deep network. The poor deep network doesn't have a chance to encode everything here. So what the poor deep network can do, however, is to look at, to look back at where I started and start piecing together step by step translations over here. So that's a good way of having a memory mechanism in my network without really having to make my state representation really complex. Because no matter how many dimensions I pick for my state representation, I can always out ramble it, I can always out talk it, I can always keep on talking for longer and longer until that poor network forgets about what I started. I mean, most of us can. So, um, okay, so I hope that answers this question a little bit. It was a little bit long winded, but okay. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, but, you know, conceptually, this is fairly straightforward. Um, so if you look at the RNN state update, right, it was actually quite straightforward. We had some hidden state, HT, and maybe that's some function phi of, you know, the previous hidden state and the previous observation. And then I get some observation out update, right? And so we saw, you know, just plain vanilla RNNs, and then we saw GRUs, and we saw LSTMs. And there are other flavors like the simple recurrent unit, SRU, and then um, there are some things that people developed by genetic algorithms, but you know, there's a handful of those things. And so the obvious question that you need to ask yourself is, you know, how can you actually go nonlinear from here? Because, well, you would like to be able to infer, you know, how I mean, you know, there's only so much complexity, so much nonlinearity that you can stuff into hidden state and observation update, right? Um, and, you know, there are two very obvious paths. So plan one is, plan A is you have some extra nonlinearity in the units. So because this is after all a multilayer perceptron. So you could say, well, you know, rather than that simple multilayer, that, that simple simple perceptron, well, let's make that more complicated. Let's have a multilayer perceptron. Maybe let's use some additional structure in there and just be really clever. Okay. And people have done this. So for instance, there's this paper from Google where it's up and low. Um, use a genetic algorithm to design a 40 cell sized or you know, 40 unit sized, you know, memory cell. 
And then they find a lot of cases where this actually works better and is, you know, maybe about 10 to 15 times slower. And this is some very complex device. And the fact that you haven't heard of it tells you that probably this didn't quite get the same critical acclaim that they probably had hoped for when they started the project. It's just really complicated and, yeah, basically, don't do it. Um, the other thing that you probably noticed is that there is not such a rich variety in basic recurrent blocks. It's maybe, you know, less than a dozen of them. So that direction of research isn't quite so promising. But yeah, you can do it. Um, so the question is a little bit, you know, why? And part of the reason why this isn't so promising is because there's a much simpler way of, you know, getting this and a lot more. And so if you have your standard RNN, well, you have your input, and you have your hidden layer, and then you have your output, right? And this implements a certain mechanics of how that hidden state behaves, right? So you would basically, you know, ignore all the white cells besides the bottom row. And that's our standard, you know, RNN template. And so one option is simply, well, you stack them up. And so the output of the first hidden layer becomes the input to the second HM, uh, you know, LSTM, which becomes the input to the third, and so on. And you keep on going up to you know, L. Um, there are a couple of downsides to this. One of them is that it becomes rather more expensive to train, and we'll see that as we look at code. As in, we'll just see the output of this, because it would take too long to run it here. Um, but the benefit is that now the specific functional form that you so happen to pick, because you picked an LSTM or a GRU or whatever, matters a lot less than the overall nonlinearity that you get by just stacking several of them up. So that's a little bit similar to what we did for perceptrons to multilayer perceptrons, right? So you could argue whether you know, the perceptron unit is really a particularly intelligent function form. And well, it's OK, but it's not great, but it's not bad either. But the good thing is that by stacking several of them up one after the other, you manage to get a much richer function class. And that richer function class actually now lets you parameterize and model a lot of different functions that otherwise, for that simple MLP, you couldn't have done. The alternative, and this is something that people used to do for a long time, and you know we wrote dozens of papers on that, and it was a good time, was basically to make the MLP itself fatter. And this is basically where you would get kernel methods like support vector machines and Gaussian processes and other things from that. And at some point, computation was in favor of this. Now computation is in favor of deep learning. But that's essentially the two paths. And just like we have that for MLPs, we have the same choice for recurrent networks. Okay. Does this sort of kind of make sense to everybody? Okay. Any questions? Because it's simple, but conceptually, it's actually quite deep. So here are the equations, right? And they are, well, fairly straightforward. So you have that, you know, HT, you know, so, so for a simple, you know, you know, RNN, you would basically have HT is some function of HT minus 1 and XT, and OT is some function G of HT. And this is replaced by h1 of t is some function, actually some function f1, of h1 of t minus 1 and xt. And then hj is just you know, given by some function fj of hj of t, t minus 1 and hj minus 1 of t. So basically taking inputs from the layer below and from the one step into the past. Right. And in the end, I just get the corresponding output. So actually, let me fix this on the slides. 
such that you can see what happens. So this is the correct representation. Question, why would it be a stupid idea to do what I had on the slides before I corrected it? Why would that not work? All right, so why would it be not such a bright idea to have the same function f to go from one hidden state to the next hidden state? Okay. Um, you could, it, it may be, but more importantly, there's not even any reason why H2 or H3 need to have, of, have the same dimensionality, right? So you could have H1 being maybe 100 dimensions, H2 being maybe 150 dimensions, and HL being maybe 110, right? So it doesn't even make sense in terms of the inputs. Furthermore, the XTs, right, I mean, they may be, I don't know, maybe 10 dimensions, right? Or there may be images, right? So, so it doesn't even make sense in terms of data types that you're pushing through. Quite often, people pick the same dimensionality for the various layers, but there is no technical requirement that you actually do that. Okay, so that's the reason why what I wrote before was not very bright. Okay, good. So then, let's actually see what this looks like in code. And 